Okay, great. Um, hi, hello. Um, welcome to the undergraduate, no, UCL undergraduate mathematics colloquium. And um, today we have uh, Matreo from IACS Kolkata, and uh, he's going to tell us about Ross's theorem on arithmetic progression. And Matreo, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to speak over here to give a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I am, so, am I audible? Yes, it's good, yes. Yeah, okay, okay fine, fine, fine. To give a brief introduction about myself, I am Maitreya Bhattacharji, an undergraduate student at the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science in Kolkata. And it's a great honor to speak here. And so my topic of today is Roth's theorem on arithmetic progression. It's history over the last seven decades after its first invention and it's some of its modern developments and what more we have to see in the coming years. So I would begin by a little apology because I was actually scheduled to deliver this lecture two weeks ago on the 7th of February, but this the postponement of my lecture was actually a blessing in disguise and I will discuss about that in details towards the end of my talk. So let's begin. So yeah. So it's time to acknowledge a few people before I formally start my lecture. I would like to thank the Undergraduate Mathematics Colloquium platform for giving me this wonderful opportunity. My sincere thanks to Dr. Proshenjit Gupta of Ilahi Technologies, Kolkata, who actually taught me a beautiful discrete mathematics course in my last semester of college, and which really inspired me to uh, explore and dig deep into the topic of, let's say, combinatorics graph theory, and so on and so forth. So thank you so much, sir. And it is. It just goes without saying that my selection of this topic is largely due to him. And I'm also extremely grateful to the Indian Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Association of America. And of course, to the American Mathematical Society for giving me access to numerous useful materials in the form of reviews, journals from time to time, whenever I have needed them for preparing talk or any of my research activity. And as always, thanks to my parents for the invaluable support and encouragement at various points of life. Nothing would be possible without them. And so uh, the slides of my lecture can be accessed uh, from uh, this web page of mine and it will be posted there. I've also sent the links to the organizer and uh, you, you can also access them from him. Okay, so. So I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of uh, the great Japanese mathematician, Professor Miki Osato, who sadly passed away in the January of 2023. I don't remember exactly the date. Actually, there were two great mathematicians who passed away in January. Uh, one is Professor Yuri Manin of MPIM Bonn, and another is Professor Miki Osato. So though unfortunately the work of Sato is not in direct relationship with what we, what we will be mostly discussing today, but he has had a huge influence on mathematics, not only through his innumerable contributions in the field of algebraic analysis, a field which he pioneered, holomorphic functions and all those, et cetera, and especially the very famous Sartotate conjecture in number theory. He also contributed to the mathematical world through nurturing some brilliant students, for example, Masaki Kashiwara, about whom most of you must have heard. So yeah, this goes to the dedication of the talk. So here is a brief outline of what people can expect from me today. So I will begin by a background and introduction to the field of arithmetic combinatorics and additive combinatorics, which form the backbone of the main theorem, which I have stated in my title. I will then state the main theorem and this some have some discussions on proofs related to it, the techniques which were mainly used at that time, and how, how can they be applied to some other results and some alternative proofs as well. I will then describe the history of progress on the quantitative version of the Roth's theorem and actually in talks of additive combinatorics or arithmetic combinatorics, it's uh, unofficially customary to describe uh, recent results which have been done in this area because often they are the results which one is discussing currently uh, depends intimately on the work which has been done previously. So that is also another goal of mine. And I will also discuss some very important tools 
involving areas of calculus, more specifically Fourier analysis, and how they are applicable in studying discrete objects like graphs or let's say sets or arithmetic progressions and so on and so forth. I will discuss two recent breakthroughs and very interestingly, one of them took place last week. That is the week between my original scheduled time of the talk and the time in which I'm currently delivering the talk. So it would have been impossible for me to discuss about this extremely exciting breakthrough, which took place uh, about one week ago, if I had delivered the talk in time. So as I had told in earlier, this postponement of the talk has been really a blessing in disguise. And of course, I will discuss about some unsolved and open questions in the field. There are numerous, but I will try to highlight some of the most prominent of them so that if you are interested, you can try them through the techniques and uh, strategies discussed in the lecture. So this talk uh, is uh, largely focuses on the work of the mathematician Klaus Schrock. Uh, so after just a few words about him. He was born in 1925 and he passed away almost a decade back in 2015. He was a German-born British mathematician who spent most of his career in England, working in Diophantine approximations uh, and arithmetic combinatorics, of course, and this is a picture of him. And he basically received his PhD from the University College of London, interestingly, in 1950, under the supervision of uh, Professor Theodore Resterman. Uh, one of his another supervisors was none other than Harold Davenport. And so, uh, as you can see that, and you will see later as well, UCL London has a very intimate connection with the development of this branch of combinatorics. So there have been numerous very famous people who have been associated with the Institute and who have done major breakthrough in this area. He actually won numerous awards in mathematics, including the Field Medal in 1958, the De Morgan Medal in 1983, and as you can, the Sylvester Medal in 1981. And as you can of course see that he was the, made the fellow of the Royal Society uh, from the title as well. And most importantly, uh, he created a very rich, rich mathematical legacy. He had a number of PhD students and uh, the people he influenced through his works and uh, by people who came in contact with him have had a uh, long lasting impact on the mathematical world. So, yeah. So some background before uh, delving deep into the topic. Uh, before that, I want to have a small disclaimer. So uh, the things which I discuss over here goes by the name of Roth's theorem, but there is another similarly named theorem, which is also known as Roth's theorem, and it's known as the Roth's theorem in Diophantine the approximation. And we will discuss, discuss nothing about that in this particular talk. And why I mentioned this thing in the beginning, because uh, when Professor Roth won his Fields Medal in 1958, it was one of his uh, advisors, uh, Harold Davenport, who said that the most famous result of Roth is his theorem on Diophantine approximation, which deals with uh, approximations of irrational numbers. And his theorem in arithmetic combinatorics is his second most important contribution. Anyway, we will not go into the former and we'll discuss in length about the later. So uh, before going into the main theorem, I will give a brief overview of the topic. So what is arithmetic combinatorics? So many of us are familiar with the branch of combinatorics in mathematics. It is basically deals with counting objects. Uh, it can be a very esoteric and uh, abstract mathematical object, or even when we learn combinatorics in beginning in college, let's say, we are often introduced to it through various real life objects, like uh, it can be cards or any other kind of object familiar to us, so on and so forth. So arithmetic combinatorics is a very exciting and active research area in mathematics, which itself lies at the intersection of several fields. So it's an extremely interdisciplinary subject and the fields include, include of course, combinatorics of which it's a sub-branch as you can uh, guess from the title of the subject and other sub-branches of combinatorics include algebraic combinatorics, so on and so forth. It also involves techniques from number theory. And over here, I have mentioned mainly analytic, which means the intersection of number theory with analysis, mostly real analysis and complex analysis. But you can, as the talk progress, I will also discuss that there are some intersections of arithmetic combinatorics with various algebraic settings as well. But 
mainly the tools which are very frequently used over here also apply to many problems, many important problems in analytic number theory, like the distribution of primes and so on and so forth. Yeah. Another area of mathematics which pertains to analysis is harmonic analysis, which is study of waves and their Fourier transforms and their decomposition into sine and cosine applies uh, uh, very well to this setting. And it was actually this topic which first intrigued my curiosity in studying arithmetic combinatorics further, because for me, it was very strange that you could study discrete objects like sets and numbers, or let's say arithmetic progression using something extremely continuous, such as uh, a Fourier transform or other analytic techniques, which were essentially uh, of distinct nature from that of the things we had studied, but it later dawned on me that these were one of the most effective tools in studying properties in, and revealing deep symmetries in sets of integers and so on and so forth. So another theory, uh, another area of mathematics, which kind of uh, comes into play while proving important results in these fields is the theory of is ergodic theory. So ergodic theory is also a very developed area of mathematics, which is also studied by numerous physicists. So it's uh, very intimately related to dynamical systems. Dynamical systems is the study of systems which is dependent on time. And as the time progresses, it takes a particular shape and it's an inter intersection area of a large number of topics, both in mathematics as well as physics. And finally, it also involves a lot of probabilistic calculation because most of the times we cannot give definite answers to questions like definite uh, bounds or definite uh, size of sets and so on and so forth. But we can, we always use kind of probabilistic techniques. Most of the times advanced probabilistic techniques like measure theory and so on and so forth to transfer our problems to settings which might be easier for us to solve and calculate and deduce our results. So, some of you can guess from the title of the slides that it's a kind of small fun because local global correspondence is a phenomenon in an, another area of mathematics, uh, especially let's say uh, algebraic number theory. But I've purposefully used the term here to describe the essence of arithmetic combinatorics. So in the setting of most problems in this field is that we take the set, uh, uh, we take any non-empty subsets of one, two up to n, and we assume some global assumption on the structure of the set. Uh, let's say uh, we assume that the set is, the size of the set is less than a certain quantity or something like that. And then we use various analytic tools to show that the object must have some very complicated and intriguing local structure. And this local structure is many times related to the arithmetic configuration of the set. So what exactly do I mean by the term arithmetic configuration? I mean that the local structure is of such a kind that it enforces the elements of the set to have some particular relation among itself or some limitations on the size of the set. So another closely related area of study is additive combinatorics. So I will say that more than being a closely related area of study, it was uh, originally one of the, uh, it originally intersected a lot with the arithmetic combinatorics, but this term, specific term of additive combinatorics was framed uh, in the year 2004 or five by Terry Tao, uh, when he wrote a famous uh, book uh, with the title additive combinatorics co-authored with Van Wu. And in the subject of additive combinatorics, we are most of the times given a subset A of the integers. And we can also take some other algebraic structure. For example, I will refer to here a result by Tau. Let's catch and Boga. Where they extend the some usual results of Erdos and Zemirari into finite field setting. If anybody is interested, they can go through the paper. It's one of the foundational papers in this area because it led rise to a lot of important techniques and, uh, to, and it also helped to prove numerous problems related to this field. Uh, it established a kind of bound of some set and product set. 
So what exactly are the subsets and the product set? So given any subset A of Z, one usually studies uh, the sum set, which is the sum of the all uh, corresponding elements of A, the difference, which is the difference of two uh, elements of A, and the product set, where each of each where two elements of A are taken at a time, the products are formed, and then the set is built, and it is known as the product set. So uh, one of the most important and classical results in this field is the oshi davenport theorem. I will, of course, not prove the entire theorem over here, but I feel that it's very important to at least uh, know some statements of some basic theorems to appreciate uh, what the field can offer. So what it basically says is that if A and B are both subsets of Zp, this is a field as p is a prime, then the size of the sum set A and B is always greater than or equal to, sorry, the minimum, oops, sorry, please excuse me. So the size of A plus B, the sum set of A and B, is always greater than or equal to the minimum of the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus one comma P. So one important thing which needs to be observed over here is that when we were defining the notion of sum set or product set, we did that using one particular subset of Z, and we did not consider two subset of Z. But in the statement of the theorem, you can see that we are considering two distinct and non-empty subsets, of course non-empty because otherwise it would not make much sense otherwise. We considered two distinct subsets of uh, a ZP, the field, and then we can say something definite about the sum set, about the cardinality of the sum set to be more exact. Okay, so. So this is a picture which I actually took from the homepage of Professor Yufeza of MIT, who is also a world leader in this field. So some of you may be familiar with very vast linking or connection programs in mathematics between apparently diverse areas, like the Langlands program, which links number theory to geometry in an extremely complicated and beautiful manner or even the homological mirror symmetry, which is a program in mathematical physics and string theory, pioneered by Maxim Konsevich, and many other kinds of programs like the program of uh, William Thurston in geometry, or the Langen program of Klein, where then the main aim of these programs is to provide some beautiful and unexpected connections between apparently distant areas of mathematics. So in this particular figure, as you see on one side, we have the area of graphs and graphs, as you all know, is a very basic object in the study of combinatorics where it involves some vertices and edges and it studies various properties of it defined. And it's an uh, extremely useful area, both in pure as well as applied mathematics. And expander graphs are nothing but a special kind of graphs. And Ramsey theory is another uh, important area of studying extremal combinatorics where uh, one studies extremal properties of graphs. Uh, so the main purpose of including this picture in this particular lecture is that it was through the work of uh, work of just forgotten the name currently the mathematicians who wanted to prove um, uh, sure yeah just remember so Isai Shur was a famous mathematician who at that time wanted to prove the Fermat's last theorem using graph theoretic techniques. 
So as we all know, the statement of Fermat's last theorem involves this particular Diophantine equation, and it says that it has no uh, solutions when n is greater than or equal to three integer solutions, most importantly. And he did not, of course, end up proving the theorem, but what he ended up proving was that this particular very strong result, actually, if n is colored using a finite number of colors, so we cannot have a large stock of colors, we have to restrict ourselves to 10 colors, five colors, 100 colors, and so on and so forth. Then this particular equation, x plus y equal to z, has a monochromatic solution. And by monochromatic, I mean that the colors of all the three integers involved in the equation, x, y, and z, are the same. So while proving this, he actually introduced, uh, he used some techniques from graphs, which had some very deep connection with this field, additive combinatrix. And in the world of additive combinatrix, as you can see, the familiar objects are the finite field, arithmetic progressions, some sets, and Fourier analysis about which, and most importantly, discrete Fourier analysis about which we will discuss in the upcoming slides. So, so there was apparently a linkage between two diverse areas through random structures and also some kind of pseudo random structures about which we will not discuss much in the uh, lecture. But this is one instance when uh, graph theory and additive combinatrix come into a lot of contact. Uh, another established, another uh, link was established by Roth himself when he proved one version of his theorem, and we will see that as the talk progresses. So a very peculiar uh, practice in this field, which I have not seen in very much in other fields of mathematics, and I just, thus I wanted to discuss that, is that when papers in these fields are written, this particular style is very much, very frequently adopted, where the authors give a kind of logical dependencies between the lemmas and theorems which one is using. And a particular important uh, reason behind this is that most of the times the results which are deduced are nothing but refinements of the previous results and using techniques which do involve a lot of machinery and also depend heavily upon heavily uh, upon the work of others. Of course, they are, they are nothing else but non, extremely uh, difficult and non-trivial refinements of the previous techniques. But this kind of practice is an extremely helpful way for, let's say, a non-expert to figure out what is going on in the paper and to learn, in fact, not only the main result, but also the techniques involved in great detail. So let's say the paper starts with a particular lemma or a theorem. And then through various connections. So you can say this is nothing else but a finite graph and connected, of course. It is linked with other results and other theorems. And this lemma may depend on the work of, let's say, some other people. And so on and so forth. So overall, this gives an overall graphic view of the paper. And uh, so this is a practice, in, especially in the world of uh, combinatrix and this area of combinatrix, which I have been especially uh, impressed, uh, impressed upon by a lot in the last few years. And I hope that uh, people in uh, working in other areas of mathematics may also adapt this helpful practice uh, in the future. So, yeah.
So let us begin our main discussion of Roth's theorem. So before that, we need to have a very important definition. So a subset X of integers uh, is said to have positive upper density. So this positive upper density terms appears extremely frequently in this field. If and only if this particular condition holds the intersection of X with N divided by N, so it's kind of uh, intersection and we, then we take the average and the supremum of it as N grows is positive. And a small notation, which I want to introduce over here is that throughout the lecture, we will often denote this, this particular set N as uh, the box of N. This is also a very standard practice. So, and we also define a KAP as key consecutive terms in a non-trivial arithmetic progression. So the term non-trivial is of central importance over here. So what do I exactly mean by non-trivial? I want to mean that uh, if the common reference of a prog arithmetic progression is zero, then you basically get nothing. You just get one number repeated a number of times and infinitely many times. For the arithmetic progression to be interesting, you need the common difference to be non-zero so that you get a different term in different times and uh, things become uh, complicated and hence interesting. And uh, so a finite arithmetic progression consisting of K terms where the co common difference is non-zero is hence known as a KAP. So, yeah. So this was the theorem of Roth and very famously published in 1953, I think in one of the journals of the London Mathematical Society. I don't remember exactly whether it was a journal of the proceedings. So he proved that every set, and which is also a subset of the natural numbers with a positive upper density, that means which satisfies this particular condition has a three AP. So there, here comes the significance of the local to global correspondence, which I had discussed a few, few slides back. So you see that we have a very simple assumption on the global structure of the set we consider. We just assume to it to have positive upper density and nothing else. And from that, we can draw a conclusion as strong as that it is forced to have a three AP. That means three terms in arithmetic progressions, which uh, satisfy this kind of relation. X plus Y is equal to two Z kind of relation. And where X, Y, Z are of course integers. And this is a picture of the uh, original paper of Roth. It was titled on, some, on certain sets of integers and the notations he used were, uh, of course, a bit outdated now. And there has been a particular numerous refinements on these results, and uh, some of them we will discuss today. Yeah. So uh, it is. It just goes without saying that it is one of the most fundamental results in arithmetic combinatorics. And as one can observe. In the first statement of the theorem, we say we do not speak explicitly about the size of the set which has a three AP. We just say that any set which has satisfies a particular kind of property has to have a three AP. More mathematically, we say that this is a kind of qualitative result and this is not a quantitative result. So what is the quantitative version of the Roth's theorem? We will see uh, in the next few slides. So when we want a quantitative version of the Roth's theorem, we want um, the size of the maximum subset of one, two, three up to N, which is forced to have a three AP. In general, we may also consider a KAP free subset in N and we consider KAP free subset. And this, the reason behind this is pretty simple that if you consider the whole of the subset, if you consider one, two, three up to N, uh, the chance, the probability is high that they will contain some kind of symmetries and structures. The speciality occurs when you take a very small subset and you observe some kind of arithmetic properties among its elements. So observing an arithmetic progression is one, you may observe something complicated, complicated as well, and the more treatment of that will be according to that. But over here, we are considering mainly arithmetic progressions. 
and improving the quantitative bounds on the maximal size of sets three of three AP, the central topic in this field. Uh, and these three AP three subsets are also known as the Salem Spencer, uh, Salem Spencer sets, by the way. And in 1953, when Roth first established his results, he mainly used the Fourier analysis. And this was this is also known in the name of the Hardy Littlewood circle method, which is an extremely important tool in uh, analytic number theory. Uh, to basically control the size of the three AP of a subset A of uh, one, two, three, up to N. Later, he also gave another proof using Zemerardi regularity lemma. And this the Zemerardi regularity lemma is a central tool in EGT. By EGT, I here mean uh, extreme and graph theory. So you can once again see that in some way that the random world of arithmetic progressions and arithmetic combinatorics is related to the world of graphs where we have some kind of discrete objects like sets and vertices, but you can very well use some powerful tools from that field and apply it to this field to prove results and uh, so on and so forth. But sadly, the tool of by method I, 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 over here, I mean the tool of Fourier analysis fails to establish the size of sets which are devoid of four AP. And so this method of Roth does not apply over here. Although the case for a four AP free sets was also settled by Roth, possibly in the year 1954, one year after uh, the publication of his famous theorem. But we will not discuss much about that in this particular lecture. And I want to also mention that there are also numerous open questions regarding the bounds on the size of KAP free sets in uh, N. Uh, one of the best places to read about this is the Wikipedia account. The Wikipedia article of arithmetic combinatorics or Roth's theorem has uh, uh, gives a nice account of the size of our KN, which is the maximal size of subset of one, two, three up to N or the square bracket N, which is free of a KAP. And I guess some of the bounds were established by Gowers, and, but there are numerous open questions and to this field. So when we discuss about the quantitative version of Roth's theorem, in, in a mathematical manner, it says that the upper bound of the size of a three AP free set is O of N by log N, where N is N of course belongs to natural numbers. So it says that if a subset, if you take a subset A of N and you want to ensure that no three of its elements are in a non-trivial arithmetic progression, then the at most the size of the set can be N by log log N. So, so what were the main tricks involved in this proof? So apparently one can notice that a difficulty which can often arise in this field is you want to establish statements about sets which are uh, which can be of let's say any size like n is random over here right so n can be very small n can be very large so these three techniques have to fail you have to re uh, rely on analysis so one very useful analogy over here can be the study of uh, prime numbers, which are of course a uh, central topic in analytic number theory. When people study prime numbers, which are essentially discrete objects, which can be described in terms of factors of a number and so on and so forth. So discrete techniques fail miserably for prime numbers. One need to develop with not only uh, powerful, but extremely powerful and ingenious analytic techniques to study prime numbers, both in the multiplicative as well as additive setting. So what are some of those techniques? So given a function whose domain is the integers and which takes values to the complex numbers, so we have a Fourier transform of that particular function given by this particular notation, f hat of theta, where x belongs to all of z and fx multiplied by e power minus x theta, uh, so this E is not the usual uh, exponential function which we come across. Uh, over here, E is defined as 
E of alpha, and I have uh, described this somewhere later in my slides as E power two pi I alpha. This is also a very central term, a central term and a topic of study in analytic number theory. It's known as exponential sum, it's quite deep. So apparently you can understand why I use the term discrete Fourier analysis in my abstract, because when we are considering these particular sets, and most importantly, the integers, the integers are by their own nature discrete. They are not continuous. So uh, it is a very uh, a common topic in uh, first year or second year calculus to learn Fourier transforms or Mellin transforms of functions such as sine or cosine, which, and we then get an integral a formula for the same and do all kinds of calculations. But over there, one needs to remember that it's a continuous setting and not a discrete setting. So to treat sets or to control the size of set in arithmetic combinatorics, most of the times you will be needing uh, the technique of discrete Fourier transform. So the argument of Roth uh, goes as follows. We assume A to be a three AP free subset of N. So A is a subset of N, which is a free of any by uh, three arithmetic progression. And then he used something to show that the Fourier coefficient of A is in general extremely large. And the main, con main uh, claim of the theorem that the A cannot have three arithmetic progressions can actually be stated in terms of some integral inequalities involving quantities of this kind. So over here, A prime alpha is a set which is defined by again the exponential, this particular exponential of elements present in A with a particular parameter alpha. And there are some integral uh, expressions. I'm not going into much details of that. If one is interested, one can, of course, see numer uh, numerous excellent uh, expositions, some of them whom I will refer in the references uh, to go through a survey of the proof, of the original proof by Roth. Uh, so there are uh, a number of integral equalities involving, uh, let's say, these are particular limits. This topic, this expression and uh, square of another expression. And so the condition that they do not have a three AP can be shown to have been equivalent to this particular thing. And the next step is actually the most important step. Uh, the importance of the step lies in the fact that uh, most of the future work which has been done in this topic uh, more or less relies on this particular step. And this step has uh, reappeared a number of times in a number of forms uh, in the works of subsequent authors. So it is no, it goes by the name of the density increment step. So what one tries to show is that uh, there exists a sub progression, a sub arithmetic progression of the original considered uh, ambient set, let's say, n, where n is nothing but one to up to n natural numbers, such that a has a density increment when restricted to this particular sub progression. So uh, this one may interpret this result by either uh, a subset S of n has Three AP, sorry, yeah. has a three AP, or there exists another progression uh, let us name that. Uh, J or S prime better such that S intersection S prime has a higher density higher density in the later set S prime than S 
in the ambient set n. So by uh, higher density, I of course refer to the definition of density, which I had originally used in the slide of Roth's theorem. And so this is a very important density increment step. And after that, one just in uh, cleverly reiterates step two to obtain upper bounds on the size of the uh, size of the set A considered. And hence the uh, proof is completed. This was just a very brief sketch of the proof. Many of the arguments originally used have been refined to such an extent nowadays that the average length of papers in these fields are uh, not less than 80. Like some of the recent breakthroughs which occurred had lengths 80 to 85, some had a length of 90. So you can understand the level of complexity involved and uh, the number of highly ingenious arguments involved and so many techniques from so many different fields in which are coming into the play. Uh, while proving uh, bounds on this particular uh, uh, set. So, yeah. So moving on, we now have a chronology of results. Uh, it's almost customary to, as I said before, to discuss what was uh, the work done by previous people uh, when discussing about bounds, especially about from, uh, regarding the subsets of integers which satisfy a particular property, in this case, the non-presence non of a non-trivial 3AP. So as, previous, as before, we define Rn to be the size of the largest subset of N, which does not contain a non-trivial 3AP. And there have been numerous refinements of Rn, and the arguments used were highly difficult and non-trivial refinements of the previous one. Although I can say that the density increment approach as discussed previously was a central tool uh, in a lot of the papers, uh, but there have been also an introduction of a number of new uh, techniques from, of course, Fourier analysis and analytic number theory and so on and so forth, which have proved to be extremely essential. So it was Roth in 1953 who established the original bound of n by log n, and almost uh, 30 years later, it was Zemiradi who improved that to, the, to this kind of exponential bound. And mind you that this kind of exponential bound is extremely difficult to uh, obtain. And personally, I have not seen any other improvements of these results, which give, gave rise to this particular bound in the last, let's say 20 to 25 years. I just saw it very recently and I will be discussing that also shortly. The next year, a heat brown improved that into n by log n to the power c, where c is a very tiny positive constant. And it was after three years that Zemiradi, Andrew Zemiradi, improved, um, refined, uh, to be very specific, refined the size of c to one by four minus o of one. This is a, a little notation. And then, Nine years later, it was Borga in 1999, who again refined the result by, to n by log n whole to the power half minus O1. So as you can see, that the thing which changes with time is that this particular exponent, and these are the difficult things. So your method is more novel if it can produce a large improvement in the previous results. So from one by four, it improved to one by two, it just increased. And in 2008, it was Bourgain again, who increased it to two by three. And after that, it was Tom Sanders in 2012, who increased to n by log n to the power three by four minus so one. And it was a Sanders the previous year, who using some other kind of technique, uh, had deduced the size, maximal size, to log log n whole power six divided by log n into n, where n is the size of the entire set. In 2014, Thomas Bloom uh, refined it to log log n to the power four by log n, where the exponent decreased. And it was the joint work of uh, Thomas Bloom and Cisak in 2019, which again improved it to log log n to the power seven divided by log n into n. And it was the work of Sean in 2020, who again refined it to log log n and decrease the exponent from seven to three plus one divided by log n into n, where n is as uh, previously defined. 
So till now we were working in the setting of uh, mainly the natural numbers. So this is a particular result in the setting of primes. And personally, I myself came across this result fairly recently while uh, preparing for this lecture. So this is a theorem of Ben Green uh, established in uh, and published in 2005. And it goes by the name of Roth's theorem in primes. So why in primes, uh, this will be clear soon. And by the way, uh, by P over here, this is not a standard notation in mathematics sadly, but uh, at least in this talk, I mean the set of primes. So, what he proved was the exact, was an exact uh, analog of Roth's theorem in the prime setting. So, every subset of P of positive upper density, so subset of P of positive upper density means that you will now intersect with the P set, the prime set contains a three AP. And the technique he used dependent, uh, depended on the Zemiradis theorem. And it also generalized a result of Volcan. And and we will come into the discussion of this in a few moments. And later, I guess, uh, three years later, jointly with Tao, he very famously proved with a theorem which now goes by the name of the Green-Tao theorem, that the set of primes has arbitrarily long arithmetic progression. So by arbitrarily long, I mean that you pick any k belonging to natural numbers, and you can find a kap, of course, a non-trivial kap, which has the size of k among the primes. So it's important to discuss at least a few techniques which were in, uh, involved in the proof. Uh, the, one of the most important techniques was the argument from the Miradi's theorem, uh, the transference principle about which we will briefly discuss at the end of the talk. It's a very standard technique in additive combinatrix where it transforms the background of the problem from one particular setup using some kind of weight function or measure to an easier setup or a setup where the density is high and where calculations can be easily done than the formal setup. So it goes by the name of transference principle. And this was actually, uh, we can say it was pioneered by Green and it, it is also related to a field known as higher order Fourier analysis. Which basically helps us to find solutions to system of uh, Diophantine equation or system of equations with integer variables in some particular uh, sparse subset of the natural numbers and not the entire natural numbers. Usually when we solve equations like 3x plus 4y equal to 5 or x plus 2 equal to 3, we consider solutions over the entire natural numbers, but in higher order Fourier analysis or other techniques, uh, have uh, the ambient setting in this particular te techniques is kind of restricted to some particular sets. And so things become interesting and the uh, use of analysis becomes much more deeper. And there was also uh, the famous use of an argument on prime gaps by Goldstone and Lynn Dream. And so as many of you may be aware that uh, James Maynard won the Fields Medal last year for his work on prime gaps. And the another person who also did a major work in this area was, I will just, this is not directly related to a discussion, but I will just mention it as a small digression, was Yitang Zhang. And what he did was also very similarly related to a refinement of an argument of Goldstone, Ilgrim, and another person. But the uh, modification made in the case of Green Tau theorem was a bit different from that, which was used to establish bounded gaps between primes. And as I'm aware, there is also a lecture in this particular colloquium series on the work of uh, Zhang and Tao and Maynard and so forth. And so the uh, argument of prime gaps was also required to establish this particular theorem. And it mainly opened a door to a lot of results in probability theory, ergodic theory, dynamical systems, and of course, combinatorix and number theory. So if someone is interested, uh, David Conlon, of Caltech, uh, Jacob Fox of Stanford and Yufei Zhao of MIT have written a very good exposition paper 
on this. It is available freely and freely on the archive. So you can just go and check it. And it contains a lot of uh, mm, details of the proofs uh, explained in a way in which a non-expert can easily follow that and gain some insights and of course apply it to results in his or her particular field if they are willing. So moving forward, we will discuss one of the most central topics in uh, arithmetic combinatorics. It is nothing else but the very famous and difficult theorem of Zemiradi. So it was the famous mathematician Paul Erdős and his very good friend Paul Turan who first conjectured in 1936 that any positive, any subset of the integers C with a positive natural density must contain a K AP for every K. So they were not able to establish that, but it was after a long time, nearly 40 years, that Andre Zemiradi established this particular theorem in his very famous paper, which appeared in the journal Acta Arithmetica. And why I call it a very difficult theorem is because it's quite difficult to follow the arguments used. And this is why later, numerous alternative proofs of a particular theorem were also given. And it is not uncommon in mathematics that a very famous result, or even not a famous result, even a very regular result which appears in textbooks often have more than one proof. Like for example, the infinitude of primes has more than I guess 200 or 300 proofs. But in this case, the complexity involved is, su is sufficiently higher. And the alternative proofs were given by very famous mathematicians uh, like Furstenberg who won the Abel Prize in 2020. And one major in, uh, reason why he won the prize was development of techniques of this kind in probability theory and ergodic theory. So he basically reproved Zemirari's theorem in 1977 using ergodic theory and very famously was by Gowers who was also associated with the University College London at some point of time, I guess during the time when he won the Fields Medal in 1998, if I'm not wrong, in 2001, combining uh, techniques from combinatorics as well as Fourier analysis. And he also developed something known as the Gower's norm, which comes into practice, which comes into play now also when people study very important problems in additive combinatorics. And it was basically Terence Chow who coined this term for Rosetta Stone for this theorem, as it brings in techniques and tools from seemingly disparate, dis disparate area of mathematics to prove one particular result. So it's quite a beautiful thing. And I hope that in future, many other proofs can also be given. And we can also have a picture of unity of different fields. So yeah, this was the theorem of Zemiradi. Uh, and it basically generalizes, uh, gives a vast generaliz generalization of the result of um, a Klaus Roth as described before, because there he was dealing with three. And here we deal with any natural number K. Uh, provided that uh, the uh, set has, of course, positive natural density, which is very important. And as you can see that we can say a lot about sets. We can say a lot about the arithmetic properties of sets, which are in some sense dense. So it is also a nice practice to transfer the, your setting if you're giving a sparse set into a dense set. And it is exactly done uh, by people uh, when they use the transference principle. Okay, so yeah. So now we will be discussing about two standard techniques in this field. One is that of the board sets. And board sets are sets and uh, more specifically a family of objects which appear very frequently in additive combinatorics and number theory, uh, most, uh, more specifically additive number theory when one needs to find some complicated local structures in some very vast ambient sets like we see. And they are always required. And the main reason why they are critical is because sets in general, specifically the sets which we study, do not have the nice property of additive structure of a group. So we are all familiar with the beautiful properties which a group possesses, and it makes that very rich mathematically. But in general, the sets which we study may not be a group. And that's why one needs to apply certain kind of operations to that to transform it into something which can be handled 
uh, more easily than the general setting. So for example, if we take the set 2z, then of course it is very easy to observe that there are infinitely many arithmetic progression. But if we take a random uh, set of the set subset A of Z, then it may not be that much easy. So that's why we need uh, some strong techniques which will help us to uh, get some further insight in the field. And that uh, one of them is Bohr sets. So before I go to the descrip formal description of Bohr sets, I want to define what is known as the character of a group. Uh, of a finite abelian group. So character chi of a finite abelian group is a homomorphism from the group G to the unit circle S1. And why I discuss this is because this will come into play when we give the formal definition of Bohr sets. So let G be a finite abelian group and uh, chi1, chi2 up to chi n are the characters on G and let delta be a constant, a real constant, which is positive then the board set of characters with respect to chi1, chi2 to chi n, and with respect to the constant delta, is defined as those elements present in G such that chi i of x belongs to E of minus delta to delta, where delta is this particular constant, and E x is the exponential of x. And by this, I mean that if we take the unit circle S1, so this will belong to a kind of arc of length two pi delta roughly, we can say where delta is a constant. And the Bohr sets help to transfer uh, randomly occurring sets into something uh, well-structured for them, for us to uh, appeal to more uh, uh, powerful arithmetic and give us some necessary information about the arithmetic progressions possessed about them, possessed in them. So this was one particular technique which I wanted to mention. And next comes the transference principle, which is also known as the dense model lemma. And this is because it is highly dependent on probability theory and measure theory. So up, uh, as you saw in the definition of Bohr sets that it is a particular uh, kind of set Transference principle is not a particular uh, theorem or lemma. It is actually a collection of techniques which aims to show that a sufficiently pseudo-random set will actually be not very much different from its ambient set. And in our setting, the ambient set is mostly the set of natural numbers in some statistical sense uh, in what we will discuss it. And so the it, a very common strategy and applies to a lot of problems in arithmetic combinatorics. And there are also uh, restatements of famous theorems using, so like even the Roth's theorem, I guess. Those have alternative st statements using uh, the transference lemma or the dense model lemma. A uh, very uh, useful resource regarding this is the blog by uh, Tao, what's new? And in one of his blog posts, blog posts, I guess, uh, five to six years old, he gives a brief lecture note about this uh, particular principle. And he illustrates that through an alternative statement of the Roth's theorem, that how it comes into play and how it can be applied to many other problems and settings. You think. The main thing about this is that if we are given a sparse set, and sparse set is a particular subset of natural numbers with the property that they do not take up a positive proportion of intervals of the natural number for if we consider large enough intervals. For example, if you consider prime, then by the prime number theorem, you know that the number of primes as n grows is more or less equal to n by log n. So if you take the quantity n by log n, and if n tends to infinity, then this tends to zero. So you see that they do not take up a positive proportion of intervals. And so the primes are famous examples of a sparse set. And the main trickery involved in transference principle is that when you are given a sparse set, you aim to construct a dense subset of integers which kind of statistically models the sparse set. You assign a 
suitable characteristic function to each element so that it helps to model the sparse set. And like where if A is a sparse set and S is another superset of A, which is contained inside the natural number, uh, which is contained inside one to three up to N, then our aim is to construct the dense set A such that the Fourier transform of A is more or less equal to the Fourier transform of uh, the dense set scaled appropriately by the size of N and the, by the size of S, where S is a superset of A, and they are uh, point-wise convergent, uh, which is very easy to observe. And then we can say, we can actually conclude more mathematical information about the original sparse set than in its uh, raw setting. I mean, so the main advantage of this, of this technique is that you can use a number of results in probability theory and measure theory to transfer your setting into a completely different setting, but then you do all the arithmetic and then you can predict even better about the sparse set. So yeah, this was the transference principle and it was famously used in the green tau theorem, I guess for the first time, uh, if I'm not wrong. And it was also sub subsequently used in a number of famous proofs of the number of famous results in this field. Yeah. A breakthrough took place in the pandemic year in the 2020, when the two mathematicians, Bloom and Sisa, Bloom over here refers to Thomas Bloom, and he has given a number of talks regarding this particular topic. Interested people can uh, check out in YouTube. It's available in the channel of Institute for Advanced Study as well as uh, in the channel of Webinar of Additive Combinatorics, where they improved upon the size of three AP free sets of N. So as you can see, there was a quantum magazine coverage of the particular result where a land, landmark mathematical proof clears hurdle in top Erdos conjecture. By top Erdos conjecture, there are a number of problems of Erdos which are still uh, unsolved to this date. But what the result of Bloom and Fisak implied is that let n is a, be a natural number greater than two. And by a usual setting, we have that A is a set with no non trivial tree arithmetic progression, then you can see that they actually give a uh, upper bound on the cardinality of n in terms of n, and they break the logarithmic barrier in the original upper bound of Roth, we had a term like n by log log n. And in this particular term, one log gets eliminated and we are just left with another log and c is a constant and we have a power of one plus C. So this was a major uh, advancement in this area. And there was a lot of buzz about it uh, uh, regarding this particular improvement. And this was the state of things until the 7th of February when I was originally scheduled to give this lecture. But something interesting took place after that time. On the 14th of February during the night time, I usually browse the archive regularly and some I was a bit busy on 14th, so I could not browse it on the morning. So I was just randomly going through the archive during the night when I very like suddenly came across a preprint by Kele and Meka. Meka is a professor at UCLA. He is also uh, from India as well, where I found that they gave a very improved bound on three AP free subsets of N. I was quite surprised that I had already prepared the talk a lot and I thought that I would have to erase some of the portions because of this particular thing. And I was a bit confused about what to do, but I was happy at the same time to see such a, such a extremely rapid improvement, better than even conjectured before. If you follow some of the talks by Bloom, at one point he says that the, it, at one point he conjectures that the maximal size of a uh, free AP free subset of N is less than EXP of minus O and then this particular expression multiplied by N. But the, what Kele and Mega give us is that a um, better bound, he, they even bound it, upper bound it by two, which is of course less than the value of V. And beta is an absolute positive constant. So this, was a, this is a very big result, which is available in the archive. Uh, and I came across it on 14th, and a few hours later, I also saw a blog post by Gil Kalai, 
where he describes this particular uh, result in details. And I was even more surprised the next day when I was again browsing through the archive, this time in the morning, and then I came across an exposition on this particular result by none other than the original authors who were doing a lot of work in this field during the pandemic and the previous years, Bloom and Cesar. And what startled me the most was the unusually small time gap. I mean, when the origin, the paper by Kelly and Mekka was quite large, I guess it, as I told before, uh, 70 or 80 pages, but it took Bloom and Sisak just one day to post another review. Of course, they were in touch and I just briefly skimmed through, through the manuscript of uh, Mekka and Kelly. And at one point they acknowledged Bloom for their work. So I am quite certain that they were in touch uh, with each other, but the developments happened quite rapidly and uh, so you can see that this is a very beautiful uh, review, by the way. If you go across this, they not only discuss their own techniques, but how uh, the two later authors modified the technique to obtain later to obtain better bounds, and so on and so forth. And uh, they also, apart from giving a fantastic review, they also improve the lower bounds for finding long arithmetic progressions in triple sums, so a plus a plus a, where a is a subset of one by n. And I was quite happy to see this rapid state of development in arithmetic combinatorics. And I'm quite hopeful and optimistic that many more beautiful things would follow in the future. Uh, yeah. So um, I think my time is almost up. So we discussed some open questions. So this is a very famous open problem in this field, which, has, which was partially answered by the Green Tau theorem in 2008, but in its full generality, it's still open, wide open, the Erdos conjecture and arithmetic progressions. So let A be a large set. And by large set, I mean that if you take the inverse sum of reciprocal sum of the elements present in A, then they diverge. So as you know that uh, the set of natural numbers is a large set because one plus one by two plus one by three, this is famously known as the harmonic sum this does not converge to any particular value, but it diverges to infinity. Then we can say that A has arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. In particular, it has arbitrarily, if you choose, if you give me any particular natural number K, then I will return you a natural number, and then I will return you an arithmetic progression of length K consisting of elements solely from the set A. So in its special case, in the case of natural numbers, it was, settled by Zemeradi, and as you can see, it's a uh, specialization of this uh, conjecture, but uh, even though a lot of effort has been given, it is still open. And so this is a central uh, challenge in this field. Another open question, actually a collection of open questions was collected by Gowers in a tight, in a survey of his, across which I came across uh, a few weeks back while preparing this talk. And if you Google it, you will find it. Some unsolved problems in additive and combinatorial number theory. It discusses some of the techniques involved as well as a number of unsolved problems. And there is a 300 page book by Bajanov posted in 2017, where he discusses numerous open questions, uh, not only in the natural number theoretic setting, but also sometimes in group theoretic setting and so on and so forth. And there is also a very beautiful uh, article by Sun posted in the archive in 2013, where he discusses about 30 major open problems in additive combinatorics. So like in many fields of mathematics, this is such a field that uh, more open questions are created than they are solved. But of course, a, so getting even a minor improvement is a huge deal and involves a lot of refinements of previous techniques. And yeah, so I'm almost at the end of my talk. There, there is a very extensive source of references which one can uh, use, which one can use by self studying this topic. And of course, there are a quite, uh, quite a few lecture videos and tutorials as well. So this is the original paper of Klaus Roth, to which I referred in one of my early slides. Yeah, it was published in the Journal of the London Math Society. And this is the review by Conlon, Fox and Zhao about the Green Tau theorem. It appeared in the EMS surveys of mathematical sciences in 2014. And this is a central reference in this field, the book by Van Bue and Terence Shaw. Its title is Additive Combinatorics. Uh, ben Green has a beautiful uh, 
math science review of this particular book where he also gives his uh, own definition of uh, additive combinatorics interested people please go through it's highly recommended Yufe Zhao has an upcoming big project and the title of his book is graph theory and additive combinatorics exploring structure and randomness it's about to be published by Cambridge University Press and more details about it can be found in his MIT homepage and Andrew Granville Solimosi uh, Nathanson and Bernard have also written a book titled additive combinatorics it's published by AMS in 2007 and it's uh, it's very good for uh, beginners or who want to learn the basics of the field using a bit of prior knowledge, let's say in abstract algebra or uh, real analysis. This is a beautiful paper for students who are uh, interested in exploring the original proof of Roth theorem. What I did today was just a brief overview of the proof and mainly the discussions of the techniques involved. But the main proof involves a number of subtle machineries. Uh, a number of equalities and inequalities involving a few quantities and Fourier transform. And Champrand Deville has written a beautiful exposition on the same, and it's a good uh, document to explore. Uh, these are the very references from the recent papers. This is a paper by Kelly and Meka, which I refer in my talk. It's titled Strong Bounds for 3AP. You can find it in the archive. And this is a survey paper by Bloom and Sisak, which followed uh, very quickly after the original paper was posted. And I will refer to my audience to another work of Tao. And this was uh, published when he won the Fields Medal in 2006. It goes by the title of Dichotomy Between Structure and Randomness, Arithmetic Progression and Primes. So by listening to the title only, you can guess that he goes about to describe the links between the discrete objects like arithmetic progressions and primes and how the tools used to investigate randomness, especially analysis, can give us extremely valuable information about those particular objects, although there clearly exists a dichotomy between the two. So the calculus mostly applies apart from discrete calculus and so on and so forth. I'm just referring to classical calculus and real analysis or even complex analysis applies to continuous objects and primes are quite discrete but the dichotomy is extremely well respected by uh, people and it gives rise to a huge amount of information. It is also freely available in the archive and also in the proceedings of the ICM, 2006 ICM. Yeah. So, and what I referred to in my slide concerning the open questions, this is a book linked to the book by Bajnok posted in 2017 and the article by Sun posted in uh, 2013. And this may also be of great help, especially I will say for undergraduate researchers who want to do a summer project of, of this kind in uh, combinatorics and or discrete mathematics. And so this is a very useful and helpful resource. Uh, this was all about paper resources. So nowadays I also have adopted the technique of acknowledging YouTube and the wonderful work it has been doing for people like us self learners to grasp a particular subject. So I will give reference to, references to numerous uh, YouTube uh, resources, which I've also personally used extens extensively about during studying the topic as well as preparing for this lecture. Uh, so there is this famous webinar series organized by uh, Sarah Peluz of IS Princeton uh, and a number of few other people as well. I think Prandeville is also one of the organizers. Its title is Webinar in Additive Combinatorics. It has over 70 or 75 videos posted in it and many eminent people have spoken in this series and described their works and strategies, including Thomas Bloom, and he had spoken in one of the uh, uh, webinars. And I, it's highly recommended for this, uh, for study on additive combinatorics. There was also a workshop on this particular topic held in March 2020, just before the pandemic at ICTST, which is a branch of uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore and all its uh, recordings of the lectures are freely available in the internet. And this is also highly recommended because it describes results from not only, let's say, traditional combinatorial uh, arguments, but also digs deep into some analytic and combinatorial side of number theory. So one can relate both of the subjects well. And there are a number of good speakers who give exposition on the transference principle or the board sets in details. And so one can go through that as well. And another uh, good pedagogical resource, I would say, 
is this lecture series on additive combinatorics, uh, which was a part of the Cambridge part three course by none other than Gaur himself. It's freely available in the internet. And uh, good features of this particular series is that uh, not only the theory is discussed in details, but a number of problems are solved, which gives a person uh, uh, overall view of the subject. And in the end, there is a course on graph theory and additive combinatorics conducted by Yufei Zhao at MIT. It's available freely as a part of MIT Open Courseware. It was conducted in the fall of 2019. Personally, I have learned of quite a few things by viewing the course. I have not yet done with that, uh, but some of the initial videos are quite helpful and it can provide you a overall exposition to both graph theory and as well as additive combinatorics, some of the results, and it can well justify the diagram which I had used uh, in the bill, like in the beginning portion of my lecture. So the apparent uh, relation between the two areas and how they are linked through randomness and pseudo randomness. So I'm mostly done with my lecture. Um, yeah, so just a small advertisement from my side, uh, a group of enthusiastic students at IACS uh, organized a bi-weekly undergraduate seminar series just like you people do at UCL. And we strongly aim at the dissipation of knowledge of science and mathematics and networking among undergraduate students as well as postgraduate students from all throughout the world. I heartily welcome you to share your work and give a talk in our forum. This is our YouTube handle. If you have any particular uh, query regarding to this uh, webinar series, you can of course email to this address. This is our homepage and our logo. Uh, you're of course always welcome to uh, contact us to give a talk and you can even contact us for the Zoom link for, in which we conduct our programs. I'm, I'm optimistic that you would enjoy them. And with that, I come to the end of today's talk. Uh, thank you for your time and attention and I'm open to questions.